Uh, good afternoon, His Excellency Michael Appleton, New Zealand High Commissioner for Sri Lanka and Maldives. Our guest speaker today, Dr. Anura Jayasinghe, distinguished past presidents, secretary and the council members of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, members and invitees joining in person and also by Zoom. I welcome all of you to this special session on uh, New Zealand public health system and lessons from the COVID-19 response. I would like to first and foremost welcome very warmly uh, High Commissioner Appleton to the Sri Lanka Medical Association and we would like to also um, pass on our best of wishes for you on your special day today. It's, it's a High Commissioner's birthday today. So we are deeply honoured that uh, you took time to uh, be part of our uh, special lecture today. And I would also like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Anura Jayasinghe, who has been a friend and also a uh, professional colleague who is also a community physician like myself. And uh, he offered to deliver this lecture today, uh, just before he uh, goes back to New Zealand uh, tomorrow. Uh, so the structure is that we will uh, invite uh, Anura to speak first on the topic for today, and then we'll have an open discussion, and then uh, I will uh, make some remarks and uh, invite the High Commissioner to speak a few words, and uh, we would like to build a relationship between Sri Lanka and New Zealand. This is the first time, and uh, our High Commissioner uh, Appleton is the first High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, the first uh, uh, embassy, uh, the High Commission to be uh, established in Sri Lanka, I think a year ago or so. So um, uh, we have a very important uh, relationship with New Zealand, professional relationships, not our doctors are there, our postgraduate uh, trainees are being sent there. So we need to have closer collaboration, both at a, a kind of a academic and a professional level, but also at a social level. So we look forward to your support, sir, uh, and a, a very long-term uh, partnership with the SLMA. So uh, with that, let me introduce our guest speaker today. Dr. Anura Jayasinghe is a vocationally registered public health specialist with the New Zealand Medical Council and works as a designated medical officer of health in Health New Zealand uh, in Tarai Viti district. Anura has worked in the health sector for over 20 years and he has held different public health positions in the health ministries in Sri Lanka, the Cook Islands and New Zealand. He has been working at the epidemiology unit for a long time and he has, a, uh, he has master's and doctorate uh, degrees in community medicine from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine of University of Colombo. He is a fellow in public health medicine at the New Zealand College of Public Health Medicine and a former honorary fellow at the University of Melbourne. He led the COVID prevention and control programs as a designated medical officer of health in the Ministry of Health New Zealand. Also, he guided the vaccination program and quarantine-free travel in Cook Islands of Ministry of Health. So, on behalf of the Council of Sri Lanka Medical Association, it's my great pleasure and honour to invite Anura to deliver the guest's uh, lecture on New Zealand public health system and lessons from COVID-19 response. Over to you, Anura. Thank you very much, Vinya. Here are, uh, good afternoon and I Um Welcome, Michael Appleton. Uh, um, I warmly welcome you as a Sri Lankan New Zealander <laughs> and my teachers and uh, friends and other supportive staff and who connect through the uh, uh, Zoom or online. So just I describe a uh, little bit about New Zealand health system as well as our experience in COVID prevention and management. So I would like to spare time for the discussion because uh, all this information you can get through Google or somewhere, but I think you would like to know my personal experience because I was a, a medical officer of health work on the ground at the time of COVID, before start the COVID and during COVID. And uh, I was working there uh, three years with the COVID. So <clears throat> just I show this uh, slide because at the moment, New Zealand Ministry of Health is restructuring. This is mainly with the experience of the COVID pandemic. So far, public health services deliver through district health board, 
in New Zealand system. But now it is restructuring to deliver the service regionally, nationally. Ministry of Health is responsible for policy, strategic directions, and monitoring overall performance. Now it is transformed into public health agency and do the same task, including medical intelligence. Medical intelligence means manage health information, analysis, and interpretation. Maori is Aboriginal community in New Zealand and over 15% of New Zealand population is Maori. Their health status are lower than that of the other ethnicities. Maori and European in New Zealand have treaty, it's called Treaty of Waitangi. So the New Zealand government has a mandate to get involved them with all programs and protect them. Therefore, all New Zealand services prioritize, tailored, and focus on Maori needs. In the new health structure, Maori Health Authority is responsible for advising the Maori health. Health New Zealand is responsible for day-to-day -day running of whole health system. I work in the Health New Zealand as a specialist in public health medicine and statutory officer called Designated Medical Officer of Health. Also other services, other health services deliver through contract or commissioning service in New Zealand. This is the basic structure of New Zealand health service. Then we'll see how the public get health services in New Zealand because it is important to see the structure, how public go to the healthcare and what the system arrange for them. If I say briefly, healthcare in New Zealand is a mixture of free services and subsidized services, where you pay a fee to cover some of the cost. For example, most hospital visits and visits to general practice for children aged under 13 are free of charge. GP's appointment for other age groups and picking up a prescription from the pharmacy do cost, even with a government subsidy. Accident Compensation Corporation Program, it is new, it's nice. ACC covers healthcare after accidents. In most cases, you won't have to pay, you, you don't want to pay for care after an, an accident. The Accident Compensation Corporation is a government agency that provides no fault person, personal injury, no fault, I mean, no self harms, no, like no fault personal injuries. Cover for all New Zealand residents and visitors to New Zealand. Anyone needing emergency care in a hospital as a result of an accident will be covered by this ACC. ACC may also contribute to wide range of medical costs associated with accident, including doctor's visits, treatments from various other health professionals, surgery, x-rays, and prescriptions. The National Immunization Schedule is the series of vaccines, like in Sri Lanka, that are offered free to babies, children, adolescents, and adults. Public health services, including some prophylaxis treatments and vaccines, are free for the public in case of disease outbreak prevention and management, like COVID measles. Almost all the services were free for the public in COVID management. Most of services related to COVID were free for visitors. Also free maternity care, free fertility service, 24-7 free medical advice services available in New Zealand. Who can access free health care in New Zealand? Free and subsidized care is only available to New Zealand residents with some exceptions for visitors from countries such as UK and Australia. 
This is because these countries have mutual agreement which allow New Zealanders to access their healthcare services in a similar way. ACC covers healthcare after accidents for all visitors, everyone. So I would like, I like this slide because this is something different to Sri Lanka. Also, I can remember 15 years ago when I was in working in epidemiology unit, I was worked with World Health Organization Sri, Sri Lanka to introduce a unique patient ident identification number. I think patient in Sri Lanka doesn't have an index or identification number yet. I don't know. A national health index number in New Zealand is useful in case of patient safety, effective and efficient patient's management, <laughs> assuring patient's confidentiality, sharing information and communication. A national health index number is assigned to anyone who uses health and disability support services in New Zealand. This number match to certain kind of information about you that is securely stored on a national health index, your name, address, date of birth, place of birth, gender, New Zealand residence, and citizenship status and ethnicity. General practice in New Zealand. Visit to the GP cost less if you enroll with a medical clinic. It is new. To, not new, it is different to New Sri Lanka. If you enroll with one clinic, then visit a different one, your visit may cost more. Seeing a GP or picking up a prescription outside usual working hours, <laughs> means 8.30 to 5 p.m. and weekends, often cost more for patients. Most family doctors operate on an appointment-only basis but some offers walk-in services. Non-urgent appointment at the hospital can generally only obtain by a referral from your GP. You don't need a referral in an emergency to attend hospital, but if you have attend an after hours, um, then uh, you won't get, if you get a referral from your GP, you can get a priority. If you need a blood test, urine test, x-ray, ultrasound, or other diagnostic procedures, you can access these most of the time for free if you have been referred by your GP. There are some cases where you may have to pay for some tests. When I was working in the epidemiology in Sri Lanka, we designed a program with a medical information unit in the ministry to introduce patient information platform. This was one of our dreams those days. I think it's still it is a dream here. Yeah? Uh, Manage My Health is a secure health portal used in New Zealand that empower people to take charge of their health and extend the capabilities of health practices to let them focus on patient care. At the moment, over 1.5 million Kiwis and over 600 health centers use this portal. Usually I also check my, mani uh, my manage uh, my health to see my records and share my records with uh, GP practices or other agencies. I show the first page of my personal record in this slide. I didn't put my personal details, but you can see. Manage My Health has made it simple and easy for you to take care of your and your family health. You can access the patient's portal online anytime, anywhere, to connect with your clinic. Even if you don't see your doctor often, manage My Health support to maintain your health and well-being. You can use the helpful online tools to improve your health, track your progress online. It is quick and easy to register. 
we can communicate with our GPs, see medications, request prescriptions, make appointments. The most interestingly, we can check our investigation report online when we give our samples to doctors. Very recently, New Zealand introduced uh, immunization advice. It has fact sheets, vaccine updates, and more important information. I would invite you to visit this website and experience the client's friendly platform. You can generate the immunization schedule through this website. It is interactive. It is beautiful. I generate one under my name here to show you. Vaccination coverage is not that great in New Zealand, specifically among Maori people and Pacific people. Therefore, many vaccine promotion activities are going on to increase the vaccination coverage among children. You can see that uh, the schedule of vaccination for the person, if you have a child, then you can generate the the schedule and you can paste somewhere, then easily you can see when you want to take your child to the doctor or vaccination center. <clears throat> there are many factors influence on the health status of the country. Budgetary allocation for the health services are one of the main things. Two weeks ago, I presented at the World Congress on Public Health in Rome, Italy, the important message I got from there is, don't waste time and energy to plan health services if we don't have an idea about the health budget. Because if we don't have money, why we waste time to plan? So firstly, we want to know what's our budget and our capacity. The other thing I learned, they pointed out the health minister in a country should be the best influencer because health minister should collect money for their budget. So uh, that's the main thing. This slide shows the current health expenditure per capita in US dollars, 4,000 in New Zealand and 150, 000, sorry, 150 US dollars in Sri Lanka. I just, just show this and don't go to compare both countries as the discrepancy is so huge. As I mentioned, health expenditure of both countries are not comparable. Therefore, the health outcome like life expectancy has a gap. However, there are many factors influence on the life expectancy. That is why New Zealand total life expectancy is 82 years. This is comparison of maternal mortality. Sri Lanka has dropped it significantly 15 to 20 years ago. I think Sri Lanka can learn much from New Zealand health system and improve the status. So <clears throat> this, uh, I finish my first part. I'll continue uh, in other part uh, about the COVID response. Then after that, we will have time to uh, questions and answer. I selected this slide to show the unity between political leadership and public health input in control COVID pandemic. I know I always follow Sri Lankan situation. This is very important lesson to Sri Lanka. Unity between political leadership and public health or scientist inputs. I worked as a medical officer of health in Southern District Health Board in New Zealand at the beginning of COVID pandemic. Medical officer of health is the lead public health statutory officer with the vested power of Ministry of Health Director General. In this picture, the smart man is Ashley Bloomfield, our former Director General. With the time limitation, I'm not going to describe the whole New Zealand COVID prevention program, but I'm proud to say New Zealand is one of the leading countries which control the pandemic with minimum harm to their people. 
we will have time for questions and answers at the end of this presentation. Then I can answer you a question if you have. If I say briefly, the main strategies for our success was border management and quarantine, a national immunization register, vaccine mandates and passes, and national case and contact management system, and framework to manage physical distancing and mask use. In this graph, you can see, unfortunately, COVID death rate in Sri Lanka is higher than New Zealand. But when we compare mortality statistics, New Zealand with other developed country, New Zealand is the lowest mortality rate due to COVID, due to the strategies we follow to control and prevent COVID as well as prevent death. Due to complications, multi-organ failure, long-term effect. It is difficult to specify COVID deaths because some people get COVID two, three times at the moment. This slide shows the cumulative deaths from all causes compared to projection based on previous year. New Zealand death rate is lowest out of all developed countries you can see here. In New Zealand, roll out vaccine and improve treatments before widespread infection during the pandemic's third year is one of the main effective intervention which reduced the mortality because our people had or gained immunity against COVID once COVID come to the community. The immunity resulting from the cumulative effect, effect of vaccination and prior expose is reducing the severity of infection and death. So this is my last slide. So I would say uh, the reason for New Zealand success, I don't go to uh, discuss each and every task and items. But there are a lot of stories share with you. Uh, we not, not need to be hurried today when you can communicate with us and we can learn later. The, the reasons, the first one is taking a precautionary approach in the face of uncertainty. Initially, we don't know the virus. Initially, we don't know the investigation or treatment, whatever. We didn't have vaccine. But with the scientific evidence, political leadership taken proper and brave actions. We do not, do not know whether future variants will be more or less virulent. The other thing is Omicron shows high capacity of, for reinfection, which will need to be managed if this variants remain dominant. We did many predictions, projections, and plan public health response. Just we get COVID, or before get the COVID to New Zealand, our uh, intelligence unit prepare predictions and a lot of scientific uh, studies, and they train our people, they establish uh, training centers, investigation centers, hospitals, and preparation is very, very uh, advanced in New Zealand at the time of COVID pandemic. Enhancing equity most vulnerable, such as low-income people are vulnerable, you know. Elderly, comorbidities, Pacific and Maori people are, were highly vulnerable. Population level focus to individual measures like vaccination, mask use, and self-isolation. These are the main thing. We highly prioritize the services for these highly vulnerable people because we wanted to prevent death. The another thing is improving communication, policy, responsiveness, and trust. The New Zealand government enhanced public trust by showing that the response is risk-based, not political, based on political agenda. It's a risk-based and scientific-based communication. For example, by phasing out 
travel restriction and border isolation requirement. It's highly impact on COVID control in New Zealand and prevent deaths. Improving evidence, informed leadership and adaptability. New Zealand science-based strategic response has been generally successful. It has a time been reactive rather than proactive. We reactive, we get lessons from other countries, we gather information, we analyze the information, we use a lot of mathematical models to see how many cases we'll get, and we prepare our hospital, ICU, and set up everything. So that's the secret of control depth in New Zealand. Invest in public health infrastructure is other things. Train people, allocate money, find other resources, lab facilities, and everything. So, at, I mean, as the conclusion, I would say the New Zealand COVID prevention and control and successful story is due to the scientific base preparedness. No other magic. And also, New Zealand people are responsible and accountable and love each other. So they do their stuff to protect others. They usually don't ask to do things, gods or someone. They do their stuff themselves. So it is, it is the main thing I observe as a Sri Lankan in New Zealand. So if we follow the same science, we can get the same results in Sri Lanka because we have a lot of resources and people and like-minded and uh, supportive people. Okay, I think uh, I finished my prepared lecture. So this is a time to discuss and if I can answer something, I can answer or later on I can find some information if I don't know or just I can lead you to find the answer. Thank you very much uh, Anura. So you can uh, join the panel here and then uh, we have questions. So uh, thank you very much Dr. Jai Singh uh, for that excellent presentation. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So uh, if, you, if you like you can sit here and answer. Uh, so there is uh, Professor Indika Karunathilak, our past president. We'll start with uh, Indika. Mike. And those who are joining online, you also raise your hand and then we can see you and then we'll uh, open the mic for you. New area, no one really knew what COVID was. Actually, the first national level seminar on COVID was held in this very venue uh, on uh, February 2020. And as you may be aware, there were a lot of travel restrictions and a lot of mobility restrictions during the early part. And therefore, initially, it was very much under control. Minimal deaths and even the number of patients were very limited. However, later, uh, the interest has a little bit waned and gone down and some of the precautionary measures were relaxed. And most importantly, the focus on the areas that you mentioned uh, have, have gone a bit uh, onto the uh, digression. So therefore, around say, latter part of 2020, there was one peak. And more importantly, you may remember, in uh, 2021, around uh, May, June, the, there was a catastrophic situation where thousands and thousands of patients were being reported. And that was very unusual because that has never been the case. And hundreds of people dying. And the health system was on the verge of collapse during that time period. So uh, one thing, one information I want to share is that being a country with limited resources, one intervention that we have implemented under the leadership of Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with others, uh, because at that point, the need was to identify who was really need the urgent treatment. Previously, the policy was to admit everyone. But at that point, it was not possible. So it was very important to identify who need immediate treatment because in that way, we could have saved life. So therefore, we introduced a telemedicine-based triage system 
under the leadership of Sri Lanka Medical Association with the Sri Lanka telecom providers as well as the health ministry, WHO, and also the Sri Lanka military and tribal forces providing logistical support. So that was actually a huge success. The basic plan was the patients could call uh, volunteer doctors, helpline doctors, uh, through any mobile li or landline, and it's completely free of charge, and they can tell their symptoms. And based on few questions, the doctors were trained to identify their situation, whether they need urgent treatment, or they can wait at home, or they need delayed admission, with few questions based on their the number of days of fever, shortness of breath, so on and so forth. And uh, then there was now, the most important thing was a collaboration between the ministry, medical association, telecommunication part, uh, partners, and also the National Ambulance Service. Because with that service, the patients could call, and the doctors could identify and take a decision. And then the message could be sent to the ambulance service, and they go to the patient's house, and they will take them to the hospital. So it was a very coordinated system. And the results were actually spectacular. Within a few days, the number of deaths started going down. I don't think we can attribute everything with that service, but there was a very clear correlation. Even the number of ICU occupancy or the oxygen dependence, they were going down drastically. And there were several papers on that also. So I just want to share that experience with all of you. Because that was a good example where in a country with limited resources based on using the available technology, you can do a lot of things. Thank you. Dr. Zindika, I think uh, there are there's a lot of experience that can be shared between the two countries. So uh, I would like to ask if there are any other uh, questions. Yes, uh, Dr. Lahiru Kodituaku. Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation. I think uh, during the last phase of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we experienced some vaccine hesitancy here, as well as some of the anti-vaxxers groups. So what about the uh, New Zealand situation? Have you experienced the same at New Zealand Health System? Yeah, that. <coughs> Is it on? This way? Yeah, it's on. Yep. So, it's that, like close it. vaccine hesitancy is, is uh, more stronger than Sri Lanka and New Zealand because New Zealand people enjoy their freedom always, everything. <laughs> right? So, um, there are anti vax uh, movement. Uh, some people. Uh, show their uh, documentaries or films, they send emails and use a lot of uh, different channels to prevent vaccination. So it is usual for all vaccination programs, even in Sri Lanka. So the one thing is, um, Ministry of Health, we coordinatedly main work against this message because uh, it is different in New Zealand and many people don't talk without knowledge right we identify our communicators experts and we talk the, uh, about the vaccination and successful stories and things and also we didn't focus much about that anti-vax movement because once we talk and once we try to highlight their communication, then people get the message, right? But instead of uh, struggle or instead of uh, fight with them, we try to motivate other people to get the vaccine. Right? And we sometimes we uh, give some uh, facilities, um, some uh, other like uh, reward, rewarding systems, and we use those things to promote the vaccine, but we didn't uh, work hard to struggle or fight with the anti-vax team. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, Anura, mm. now uh, what were the main reasons? Now in Sri Lanka, the vaccine hesitancy for the first and the second dose, it wasn't there, mm. right? People really uh, queued up to take the vaccine. But then there was this uh, vaccine hesitancy, particularly among the young people. And the reason was uh, sexual importance and, you know, neurological complication and all that. What was the main reason for vaccine hesitancy in New Zealand? Yes, one thing is uh, religious uh, belief. Some uh, religions or minor religion group, they believe that uh, oh, 
vaccine is not good or they, they, they really just, uh, they believe, they don't accept vaccine. Then other people like that, uh, they think about those sort of mm. um, side effects. Side effects. Oh. So similar yeah, okay. sort of things. Okay. But I, I would like to share something different because I worked in uh, Cook Islands. So we introduced vaccination program in Cook Islands. Our vaccine coverage rate is more than 100%. What we did was, first after we got the vaccine, because we started vaccination before New Zealand, New Zealand supported us to... But Cook Islands part of New Zealand. <laughs> no, but they support not part of New Zealand. Okay. It's an independent country. Oh, anyway. uh, that I didn't know. Okay, yeah. Sorry. So, what was happened? Then at the first day, we went to the church, and we I mean almost all people go to church in Cook Islands. They believe and things. Then we just announced through the church leads, and God send a vaccine to protect you. So that simple thing, no? I mean that, that's the public health. So likewise, in uh, uh, when when we introduce something new, that word should come from the trusted people, not the politician. If politician trusted, that's all right. Otherwise, if it come through different mouth, oh. people don't yeah. follow them. Thank you. I think uh, element of trust in Sri Lanka was very much enhanced by this uh, lady who led the SLMA during the crisis. So Dr. Padma Gunaratne and then uh, uh, Dr. Preeti Vijay Gunawadhan. Yeah, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, actually, I was the president, as he says, that at the peak of the COVID. And SLMA conducted so much of activities uh, for uh, public, for prevention, uh, to enhance the vaccination, and as well as the uh, professional education to safeguard the uh, knowledge of the profession as well as the public. Uh, the my uh, question or my uh, in, uh, I'm inquisitive to know that. Say uh, how the uh, New Zealand Medical Association. I mean how, now uh, though uh, we acted during our time as the Sri Lanka Medical Association and people uh, trusted the Sri Lanka Medical Association as very much the sole. Uh, uh, agency that would talk on truth and that would give them the correct information. Uh, the uh, recognition or the acceptance that the uh, approach or the access that we had to the government uh, was not close enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just would like to know how the New Zealand Medical Association was considered as an important uh, professional organization by the government of New Zealand. In New Zealand, there are many different uh, health uh, or community organizations who look after health, Maori organization, Pacific Islanders organization, and um, medical association, and other organizations, public health physicians uh, organization and things. Um, at the time of COVID, um, we couldn't uh, mean create new trust or new mechanism uh, between those organizations and public. But they, at that time, they had their own uh, communication and their own trust with the community. But the difference is, in New Zealand, once we uh, plan to send a message by the ministry, it didn't go anywhere until come out of the mouth of Director General. So the same message delivered through all organization. Mm -hmm. Then people trust mm -hmm. about organization as well as mm -hmm. people can follow the messages. So there are no many different uh, uh, messaging system like a makeup penny or something. So, sorry. And also the, now for, the problem in Sri Lanka is very much for each at each and everything is the racism and uh, how the Muslim dead bodies when they were cremated here I mean when, when they were uh, there was so much of objection for burial and some of the Muslim dead bodies were cremated and we as the Sri Lanka Medical Association we uh, uh, 
had meetings, discussions, and then we released our statement for the uh, um, for the burial of the uh, dead bodies and against creation cremation. Mm. Uh, but the uh, again that was not given any recognition, and uh, uh, it was much later for some for some other reasons that they changed that rule. So how did Muslim uh, dead bodies were treated, and how the others felt? with regard to the burial of dead bodies of Muslims. If, if I correctly um, pointed out that uh, burial or cremation, it's sort of political at that time in Sri Lanka. But in New Zealand, if we tell something as a scientist or doctors or public health specialist, it should be based on science, not based on belief. And other thing is different is we can't open mouth like this as I'm a designated medical officer of health, though I, I'm talking here now, I can't, uh, I can't communicate with the public with my own belief. Right? So then your question, yeah, then racism is uh, one of the main problem in Sri Lanka. But we can't sort this out or we can't prevent this at the time of disaster, time of pandemic. We have to work it for, to prevent it throughout our normal work. In New Zealand, I think in all offices, in all departments, there are uh, units to uh, complain about racism investigate about racism, it is something integrated in normal society. Right? So in that situation, people didn't use racism that much to suppress other people. Right? So at the time of disaster, we can't uh, sort out or we can't solve problems, innate problems of a community. How to work for that always when we are in a calm and uh, in a normal situation, I think. Thank you. Are there any questions online? If not, uh, uh, Dr. Preeti Vijayagunath, sir. Yes. Yeah, two, thanks, Arun. That was a lovely presentation. Uh, just to ask you, you mentioned about GPs. Were all GPs involved in this national program or was it sort of part-time or whatever, you know, because I see in this country, GPs who were in the private sector did their part very well, especially the trained GPs. But we also have a lot of quacks who treat people all the time and a lot of uh, wrong uh, medications were given and a lot of criticism was there classifying them as GPs. That's one question. Number two, of course, is the same question that Padma raised about uh, the bur burial situation because I feel it was just ignorance that people didn't uh, allow that, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at the beginning of COVID, I mean, usually once GP get suspected COVID case, GP should inform about the patient to the regional or district medical officer of health and discuss about situation mm -hmm. and arrange the investigation and contact tracing. So everyone, registered medical practitioners in New Zealand should follow the uh, guidelines given by the ministry. As far as my knowledge, uh, in New Zealand, no one can practice without cows, their council's that's approval. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. 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 People just walk in yeah. mm. wax clinic can then take it the wrong treatment. Other, 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 the other, get the blame for it. Yeah, other than that, I mean, I know that once we get the registration in Sri Lanka, we can practice throughout the life sometimes. But in New Zealand, every year, we have to update our registration. When we update the registration, we can't pay and get the registration. There are few things. They check criteria about our character, road traffic accident, or whatever the things. And after assess our situation, uh, if we are eligible to get the registration, then we can continue our medical practice. Otherwise, we have to do something else. So it is different, totally different. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, another question, Dr. Arun. Uh, so, you explained about the scientific uh, basis and uh, the New Zealand government is always going by the sign. So, in Sri Lanka also we saw the government is supporting some sort of up to certain extent for the research in COVID and the things. How about the New Zealand situation for mainly for the molecular basis and the research work the support? So the initially when uh, I don't know much about that, but initially when people invest for vaccination, New Zealand also uh, contributed for finding uh, vaccination for the COVID. Then uh, <clears throat> we wanted to check COVID uh, variants and the COVID testing. So then New Zealand government identified significant amount of money to invest for that. Now, then after that, change the variants. Uh, so the type of COVID. Now also, still we are maintain that uh, molecular studies, because who, who knows, sometimes it change. So still we are, then I, I, I don't think in Sri Lanka, still you do the surveillance, but in New Zealand, still we do surveillance, not only public health surveillance, uh, laboratory surveillance, hospital surveillance, we continue, then they have identified that sector as important part of outbreak management or pandemic management. So the money is one thing, that the, the, the bulk of money is one thing, but identification of important area is something else. Although we have money, so if we don't use it properly, we can't get the effective outcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Kalyan. Yeah, yeah. In the pandemic management, now, were there, now, now in Sri Lanka, we had to, because the health personnel were not enough to uh, to su support all the work, uh, I think we got the help of armed forces. Mm -hmm. What was the position in that country, in your country? Because uh, in, in New Zealand, we don't have uh, armed forces. At all. No? <laughs> yeah, then we have some mm -hmm. people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but they, they are not armed forces, they are forces, <laughs> they, they have, but the, mainly they support for disaster and things. So we didn't have a significant number of people. So in that situation, we wanted people for contact tracing and other things. So we are get support from volunteers. So we train volunteers. Government identify funds to train volunteers. Not volunteers mean uh, people who work in other sectors. So in our office, maybe two or three times of the usual staff is recruited for the COVID prevention. We train and they're working for three years now. The one, uh, yeah. the one aspect where our military and police were involved in the COVID response was in the MIQ, the managed isolation and quarantine system. Uh, the, it was uh, military and police that were providing security for those uh, facilities, not private security guards. Um, so that was the, but our, our, our number of personnel are far less than <laughs> in Sri Lanka proportionally, and so it would not have been practical for our military to have as significant a role as they did in Sri Lanka. Thank you, High Commissioner. So we close the uh, Q&A now. You have to be very quick, <laughs> yes. please. Am I uh, Thank you again. Again, related to the comment uh, that was made by Dr. Kalyan uh, Dr. Kuruge, uh, actually there was a good uh, one. One lesson maybe from uh, for us was the need for collaboration and integration between different sectors. I mean, to me, I think that that collaboration between different sectors, including Sri Lanka Medical Association, doctors side and the colleges association, then the Ministry of Health and also the armed forces and then WHO, it was a good thing in a way. Because, I mean, there was no one organization who could provide 
all the support in this kind of disaster, this kind of situation. So everyone coming with their strengths. The ministry basically called upon the medical association colleges for the technical expertise, and they have regular meetings to take decisions in that way. Uh, there was good collaboration. The military had their logistical support and the strength especially regarding disasters, and even other organizations like social support. Uh, when you were the, when, as president Saro there, so you were providing social support. So there was a nice collaboration actually in that way. That would be, I think, one lesson learned. I would uh, absolutely important message. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we conclude the Q and A session. So I thank uh, Dr. Anuraj Singh for that excellent presentation and also uh, for that uh, lively Q&A session. Um, I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, His Excellency Michael Appleton, uh, High Commissioner uh, for Sri Lanka and Maldives, New Zealand High Commissioner for Sri Lanka and Maldives. Um, now, uh, just before uh, he delivers his uh, remarks, I would like to just make uh, a small sort of uh, few comments on on this uh, partnership so sri lanka medical association is the apex uh, association of all medical doctors in sri lanka which has doctors representing the government sector the private sector the private practitioners and also the non-government sector those who are working in un so it's the most representative body of medical professionals in sri lanka with a very long history and we also collaborate with many uh, international uh, uh, organizations of similar nature and also we are very keen now we are made to understand that there are over 100 Sri Lankan uh, specialists of Sri Lankan origin working in New Zealand and uh, also it is a place where most of our younger doctors uh, prefer to go for their uh, postgraduate training and uh, our uh, secretary himself was trained in uh, New Zealand so there are many others and there's a lot of opportunities for uh, research collaboration as well and we have uh, I made to understand there there's about 15,000 to 20,000 uh, Sri Lankan uh, New Zealand Sri Lankan population there and uh, so we would like to have now that we have a high commission also here uh, to have greater collaboration at a very professional level technical level and also at a social level as well not just in the uh, field of medicine but i made to understand that a lot of universities also send for their postgraduate uh, uh, studies uh, uh, in other disciplines like chemistry and physics and so on so we look forward to your leadership sir uh, to uh, strengthen these partnerships i think you shared with us uh, that your intention was also to look at uh, other ways in which the two countries can collaborate share experiences and also help us to move in uh, recovering from this uh, economic crisis so uh, slma is playing a very crucial role at the moment uh, guiding all our uh, doctors uh, working on the ground at the same time really working on policy level decisions and this premises is a is a um, uh, is a kind of a uh, inheritance from our forefathers who have been really sacrificing their professional lives to improve the health and well-being of our people so uh, we would like SLMA to thrive and also this place is a place where uh, history is also preserved as you could see from our library and also we try to uh, serve all communities in Sri Lanka it's a very representative um, uh, council also which rep uh, represents the diversity in terms of ethnicity religion and geography and everything and uh, so we look forward to uh, your support and we also uh, try to contact the New Zealand Medical Association it's uh, and also the other associations there and uh, really move forward in uh, sharing our uh, you know goodwill and to improve the health and well-being of uh, people in Sri Lanka and I'm sure there's a lot that New Zealand can also learn from our experience as it was shared by our past presidents so over to you sir uh, to give us some uh, remarks Well, first, I just want to say thank you very much um, uh, to the president for uh, his invitation to come here. Um, we met uh, we met recently, and he told me that one of his many roles in life is uh, is leading the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, and I was delighted to be able to visit um, this important historical institution. Um, I also just wanted to say at the outset, um, congratulations for holding this talk, uh, Dr. 
Anura, I found that uh, very interesting, and uh, I think your insights into the New Zealand experience were very incisive um, and uh, of great relevance to the audience here. And I guess i just make a more general comment that COVID-19 was a very uh, dramatic and all-encompassing event that challenged uh, governments all around the world, from the poorest to the richest, uh, not just uh, the doctors, <laughs> it wasn't just a medical problem, it was a uh, communication problem, it was a political problem, it was uh, a diplomatic problem, and it was a scientific problem uh, as well. And I think all parts of all governments had to work together around the world to try and get the best uh, outcome for our people. Um, and I think uh, events like this are useful in uh, reminding us that no country got 100% um, right in responding to COVID and nobody uh, got nothing right um, and that there are things that we can learn uh, from uh, from one another. I think many New Zealanders are extremely proud by our COVID response and, our, um, and the relatively few people that we lost uh, to, um, uh, uh, to COVID, but that I think is something that can be said for Sri Lanka too um, as well. And I think uh, COVID sort of hitting up against this very uh, terrifying economic crisis, I think, has uh, made people forget that there were aspects of the Sri Lankan COVID response which were very laudable and which did save a considerable number of Sri Lankan, uh, Sri Lankan lives. Um, just talking a, a bit briefly, because you mentioned it about the New Zealand-Sri Lanka relationship, um, it's true that I am the first New Zealand High Commissioner base here in Sri Lanka, um, and I will be the first of many. Um, I've been here two years now, two of three years, which means that the hunt is already on for my, uh, for my successor. But the, the, the good thing I wanted to say about this is that the Sri Lankan government still intends to open uh, a High Commission in uh, Wellington. When the two governments announced in 2016 that they uh, would be opening uh, high commissions in each other's countries, I don't think that we imagined at that time all the difficulties that would be thrown in our way. Um, uh, obviously in Sri Lanka there was the Easter Sunday bombings and then COVID, um, which made our opening in Sri Lanka much more complicated, but they also have complicated the job of the Sri Lankan government in opening a uh, high commission in, uh, in Wellington. But my understanding is that uh, once the immediate economic crisis has passed in the next few years, that they will move forward with that as well. And I think as you talk about collaboration between our two countries, uh, that will make it much easier too, to have a Sri Lankan High Commissioner based in New Zealand. Um, in terms of our cooperation over the years, um, you have mentioned um, a whole lot of the medical connections already. I mean, I think there are, looking at the relationship and the history of uh, cooperation, I think there are two areas that stand out. One is agriculture, um, because it is a absolute cornerstone of uh, the New Zealand economy, and it is something that Sri Lanka has been seeking to do better and better over time. So one of the very first things the New Zealand government did in Sri Lanka after Sri Lanka became uh, independent uh, was to build a dairy farm um, uh, to help uh, the Sri Lankan industry uh, de develop its practices. And our cooperation with Sri Lanka on dairy issues uh, continues to this uh, very day. Most of what I've been doing the last week has been supporting visits by high-level agricultural uh, delegations to Sri Lanka uh, who are help, trying to help the Sri Lankan agricultural uh, sector during this economic crisis. So that's always been one big focus, but the other big focus has always been education. Education, education, education. And it has uh, sometimes uh, taken the form of scholarships. <laughs> In the early days, scholarships from um, uh, Sri Lankan doctors um, uh, coming to learn, or com uh, students coming to learn how to be doctors in New Zealand. Uh, it also took the form of a, you know, an intensive program in uh, the dental nursing system in Sri Lanka. There was a significant investment by New Zealand in that in the in the early years, and there continue to be uh, lots of initiatives to try to get um, more and more Sri Lankans to come to New Zealand. Um, uh, you know, usually at the postgraduate level, but I guess with medicine that's um, uh, that's slightly different. But we uh, absolutely agree with what you said that um, New Zealand has hugely benefited from its very large Sri Lankan community. Dr. Anura uh, follows in the footsteps of Sri Lankan doctors who have been doing, who have been travelling to New Zealand for decades. Um, we are conscious in this economic crisis that it is important that. Uh, we don't contribute to Sri Lanka's br brain drain, and so some of the some of the conversations we have, whether about scholarships or skilled migration, is how to make sure 
that the training that happens of Sri Lankans in New Zealand uh, leads to greater um, leads to uh, people coming home um, to Sri Lanka. Um, I suppose the last thing I'd say about that is cooperation on, on the medical uh, on the medical side. We're very um, we the New Zealand government are very supportive of that. Um, that's you know going to have to be driven largely by the respective medical associations and health systems and so on. But we are definitely um, here to help. And if there are specific um, uh, people that you want to be connected to or advice that you may have, um, uh, we're definitely here to help with that. Uh, um, our role really here is to facilitate the connection between Sri Lankans and New Zealanders who want to do more together. Um, and uh, so we're absolutely here to help. So that's all I really say. I just want to uh, thank you again for the invitation. It was a great honour to walk through your historical library and see these hundred, these books that are hundreds of years old. Um, it's amazing that doctors all, the, all those years ago were, were able to do jobs just with uh, <laughs> those, uh, those drawings like that. Um, and it was a great honour to meet the many uh, past presidents um, who are here today, um, as well as the members and the people on Zoom. So thanks very much. And um, I just uh, say that we have a, I have an open door at the High Commission. If there's ever anything anybody needs, please, please do be in touch and I'll do everything I can to help. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I would like to invite Dr. Sanjit Edri Singh uh, to uh, deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. So, as Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, the Ambassador, New Zealand Ambassador, Mr. Michael Appleton, as well as our guest speaker, Dr. Anurajai Singh. Uh, so, thank you very much once again for accepting our invitation and coming to Sri Lanka Medical Association and delivering the guest lecture as well as visiting our library. So as a person who was trained at New Zealand, I'm very happy to see both of you all in Sri Lanka. And uh, thank you very much because New Zealanders are very helpful for me during my postgraduate training. So thank you very much for, for coming uh, here. Once again, we will return our favor from this side also. So as a Sri Lanka Medical Association, as the president mentioned, we would facilitate uh, the student exchange as well as the teachers exchange and the knowledge sharing. So we will work together uh, in future as well with uh, Sri Lanka as well as with the New Zealand. So thank you once again uh, for coming here and helping us. Thank you.